The success of America's first four decades in space has been the result of a collective effort by millions of individuals. But when people talk about what Dr. Ann Whitaker brought to NASA, they don't refer to a contribution. They use the word legacy. It's hard for me to know where to begin. She did so many good things for NASA and for the Marshall Space Flight Center. She flew experiments from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Anne grew up in the rural community of Plainville, Georgia, the first of three children born to Nell and Wallace Fight. A unique blend of energy, smarts, work ethic, and popularity made her a natural leader and role model. She took her education very seriously and was the valedictorian at Calhoun County High School in 1957. At Berry College, she and her roommate were the first two female physics majors there. Another physics major she met at Berry, John Whitaker, would later become her husband. Her education would continue later, earning a master's in physics in 1968 from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. In 1989, she was awarded a doctorate in materials engineering from Auburn University. But with that bachelor's from Barry in 1962 and inspired by the space program, she began her career at NASA. She, you could tell that she had a lot on the ball. She was always very energetic and uh, she was a very good employee. I knew we had a, a diamond here. All we had to do was cultivate it a little bit. She never had a temper like I had. She was always the essence of cool. She was very cool. And quickly began her long line of leadership roles at Marshall. Well, I first met Ann Whitaker when I came to Marshall in 1964 as a cooperative education student. And I was assigned into the materials laboratory, materials division at the time, it wasn't even a lab. And Ann was my supervisor in the branch. We were in what's called engineering physics. So I got to get my hands dirty real early. We were still working on getting Saturn V ready to launch. So Ann was my mentor and really the first role model I saw. You know, when I came into the center, it's one of those things where there was a time when you really didn't know if as a woman engineer you could even be engaged in NASA and in what the, the space program was all about. But Ann was very convincing. I mean, when you walk in and your supervisor is a, is a lady, she happened to be one of three that were at the center at the time and uh, very highly respected. So that was my first exposure to Ann and it was a really good one. We were doing a lot of research there on some basic physics and how it was affecting space flight and they translated very quickly into distinctive engineering problems that, that were being worked on. But I'd have to say one of the biggest impacts was my first co-op term was actually when I went back home. Uh, when I went back home to Orlando, Florida and talked to my parents, the first thing my mother did after I had given her this long speech about this wonderful work I'd done and the people I'd met, of course Anne was one of the main topics of conversation, one of the first things mother said was, where did you get that accent? Well, I've been in Florida, but I'd lived in lots of different places. But Ann was a Georgia girl. She always will be a Georgia girl. So I got home and I had this wonderful Georgia accent, which it took me a while to shake. Well, I think one of the things that it readily says is that uh, uh, Barry's faculty and the curriculum in the physical sciences area uh, prepares Berry graduates to be competitive probably with the best schools in the country. Ann's career in the areas of materials and sciences garnered her many prestigious leadership honors, including the Presidential Rank Award. But she was, all along the way, a research scientist. I remember she had experiments on uh, Apollo Soyuz. You will recall the Apollo Soyuz mission which occurred about 30 years ago. You had a demonstration on that mission, the capillary wicking demonstration. 
Valery Kubasov, the Russian cosmonaut, and I had an opportunity to run that on orbit, as I recall. And I hope that it turned out well. Anyway, representing the crew, I would just like to uh, congratulate you for 43 years of great service. And I just hope you'll be uh, very happy in retirement and in the future. Many other flights carried Ann's experiments. She had them on Skylab 3, had them on Space Lab, had them on uh, when the shuttle started to fly, had them on STS-5, uh, 8, 11, 17, and 51G. So uh, she was really an important person in the realm of experiments for space flight. But maybe the most important one, or a very important one, was the long duration exposure facility. We called it LDEF. Um, it's a huge thing that was left in orbit, stayed up there almost six years, had a slew of materials being exposed to the space environment in orbit. In January 1990, the crew of STS-32 retrieved LDEF. Anne led the post-flight assessment team. Hello, Ann. Uh, this is Dan Brandstein, and on behalf of uh, the crew that uh, brought LDEF back for you, uh, we'd like to uh, congratulate you on an outstanding career and uh, wish you the very best uh, as uh, you start your retirement. Uh, it was uh, a real pleasure uh, bringing LDEF back for you. Actually, I think uh, it turned out to be extra LDEF by the time uh, you got it back, but uh, it was a, a real uh, pleasure catching that and, uh, and bringing it back. And uh, we were all very much impressed by the, uh, the outstanding uh, post-flight assessment. I think in uh, all my years with NASA, that was uh, the best run uh, program uh, of uh, collecting the information and disseminating it. And uh, uh, we really enjoyed uh, getting the periodic reports and, and getting to go to some of the conferences. So. Uh, once again, uh, it was a pleasure working with you. Uh, it was a, a great mission and uh, a lot of good uh, science uh, was uh, determined uh, after it. So uh, once again, we want to wish you very, uh, the very best as you retire. Anne had ambitions of going to space herself and conducting her research in orbit. Her first experience was in 1975 during a ground-based simulation called CVT. CVT was concept verification testing, and that was uh, before Space Lab was developed by Marshall and started to fly. And in fact, what that was about was concept verification testing was looking at how do people work and operate in space, but more specifically, how is research accomplished in space? So Anne and Mary Helen Johnston and I were three that decided we would get engaged with this, and we became both the principal investigators we worked with the engineering integration team, and we processed as flight crew uh, during a week-long simulated mission. And a lot of those lessons we learned out of that activity, how we interacted as a team, how we interacted with the hardware, what kind of issues there were, all of that was built around concepts that then went into the Space Lab program. So we felt like we left a fingerprint on that on our way through. And they did a lot of the experiments that were very important to us in NASA. So we hatched up this idea, well, why shouldn't the originator be the one to do the experiment in orbit? But you also will remember that in the early days of NASA, sure didn't have many female astronauts, didn't have any. So we knew astronaut was a pretty far reach, but uh, maybe payload specialist. So we worked on that hard for about 18 months. They flew on the Vomit Comet and everything else to try to get themselves ready. She's a 38-year-old wife, mother of a seven-year-old, a NASA physicist. And when she's 40, she could be the first woman since Valentina Tereshkova in 1963 to fly in space, first American woman ever. In 1980, there are two seats reserved for scientists aboard the space shuttle. Ann Whitaker is a candidate for one of them. She's a physicist, a NASA physicist, at Huntsville, Alabama, and is in competition now with five other scientists, and all of them are men, as I mentioned a few moments ago. And that is a pretty exciting prospect, being the first American to fly in space. Do you know at this point what specifically you would be doing? Well, we, if selected, of course, uh, would be training on all the experiments because we would be operating 24 hours a day. And of course, we would have time off, and but we would. Uh, 
be required to be trained on all the experiments so we would not lose an opportunity of viewing any uh, particular event. I guess we were just ahead of our times, 10 or 15 years, and it, it didn't fly. But throughout all these endeavors, it, it was pretty apparent to me what a, a, what a role model and a mentor Ann Whitaker was, tremendous. Well, she was always willing to take on something when you ask her to do that. Uh, Ann was in a materials laboratory, and then there was a real need to be doing some different things with science. Marshall was in a situation where it looked like we were going to use, lose some of the real critical science that we had been doing, and we have a cadre of tremendously talented scientists and engineers. So Ann took that job on and went on, of course, to head up Space Sciences Laboratory and acting as the head of the NSSTC when, when that became vacant. But she's always stepped in there to do what was necessary, and she felt very strongly about the science here at the center and the science at NASA, and I think she's left a legacy behind there as well. In November 2005, Dr. Ann Whitaker retired as director of the Marshall Space Flight Center's Science and Technology Directorate, ending a four-decade legacy of scientific and engineering excellence, dedication, and leadership. And through her tireless efforts as a role model and mentor during the beginnings of America's quest for space, she leaves the agency well poised for its next era of exploration, back to the moon, on to Mars, and beyond. Hey Ann, uh, our boss, as, I, as we call you, uh, it is my great honor to be able to congratulate you on your retirement. I've known you in so many different ways, Ann, uh, as a senior manager, as an employee of yours, as a colleague of yours, as an ally, as a friend. And I have always admired you, Ann, for your toughness, for your straight talk, and for your sense of humor. You are one of NASA's best, and I wish you the best as you walk into this next phase of life. So uh, be good, and please do stay in touch with us. Good luck. When I think of Ann, I still think of this uh, old Roman approbation uh, commendation. It says, sui generis, sui generis, unique, one of a kind. And Ann certainly is one of a kind. And so I say to Ann, best of luck to you in, in your retirement, whatever it is you decide to do. <laughs>